Hello, welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, the essential selection of the week's science stories. I'm Penny Sarche. And I'm Sam Wong. We've got a bit of a health special for you this week. We're hearing all about the brain's poorly understood waste disposal system and a concerning study examining the health of some child asylum seekers in Australia. But we've also got a clever modern twist on a very old classic physics experiment, the double slit experiment, and some clues from fossilised poo that could help save what must be the world's strangest parrot. But first, Claire, you've got some good news for us about human lifespans. Apparently humans are about to start living longer, is that right? (laughs) Yeah, well, hopefully. Although I should say it is based on a theoretical calculation rather than the development of a cure for ageing, I'm afraid. Okay, so uh, what's the basis for that calculation then? Hasn't lifespan been increasing for a while? Um, Well, no. So that is average life expectancy, which, as you say, has been very gradually increasing for a very long time in most countries around the world, although there are some exceptions. So that is currently at about 80 for men in the UK and 83 for women, just to give you an example. But this story is about a different number altogether. It's about the world record for the person who has lived the longest ever. Mm, I I think I remember this one. Remind us, um, it it was that woman in France. How long did she live? Yeah. So officially, the record is held by Jeanne Calmont, a French woman. And she is uh, supposed to have reached the age of 122. But she died in 1997. And her record hasn't been surpassed since. So the big question is why? So if average lifespan is increasing, why isn't the maximum human lifespan also increasing in step. So some people think it's because there there is an innate limit on the human body that and we just can't get past round about that age and never will, no matter how much progress we make in medicine. And so is that looking to be true then? Well, that was the idea. But the latest study is sort of a rebuttal of that. So it comes from an analysis of birth and death records from 19 countries, which have been lodged with a kind of independent website repository. And this finds that in people born after about 1910 or so, there is a trend for people to have somewhat longer lifespans. So they theorize that this is because of the, all the improvements in modern medicine that happened in the, the 20th century. Also, um, hygiene, I imagine, isn't that when they started building better sewers and water purification? Yeah, so so many good things happened uh, in that period, yes. So they were kind of the first tranche of people to get the benefits from all of that. But this claim, so it doesn't actually come from that kind of theoretical reasoning. It comes from the numbers of the birth and death records. So it can be seen in trends for the number of people who die at younger ages, more typical lifespans, uh, for instance, the number of people who die in their 70s, 80s, 90s. But there just hasn't been enough time yet that has passed for any one of that cohort to reach the maximum lifespan record. So, you know, to do that, they'd have to reach 122. And they haven't just had enough time yet. Okay, so uh, people who were born in 1910 have had this kind of healthier life, and they would be getting to 122 in what 2032. So we could start seeing records being broken about 10 years from now. Exactly. Although you know it's it's all very rough because they start to see this trend emerging from 1910 onwards. But yeah, that is their prediction. This, by the way, is um. An ideal story for a science reporter like me, uh, because it's making predictions about the future that are so far away. By the time it's meant to happen, you'll have forgotten I wrote this. (laughs) Well, I hope you're going to make a note of it, Claire, and we'll come back to you in a decade. (laughs) Okay. It's not so far away that uh, you're not still going to be working. Possibly. I hope so. so. And now, on to a classic physics experiment that's been reimagined with a bit of a twist. Lair, let's start with the original version. Uh, The double slit experiment is a genuine classic, but what is it? (laughs) So the double slit experiment is a really fundamental one. Um, It was first done in 1801, and it involves shining light at a card with two slits cut in it for the light to pass through. And then when the light hits a screen on the other side of the card, it shows this interference pattern of bright and dark stripes. And essentially, this is the experiment that proved that light is both a particle and a wave, right? Yeah, exactly. And other versions later on demonstrated some other quantum properties of light as well. 
So what's this new twist on the experiment then? So it's a little bit hard to explain. You know how the two slits I mentioned in the original experiment are separated by a small space? Mm. These researchers have done something similar, but separating the slits in time instead. Ooh, so that sounds very uh, clever and cool. But how does that actually work in practice? How do you do that? (laughs) (laughs) So they use this special material that goes from being transparent to reflective when you shine a powerful laser at it. So when they shoot two laser pulses at it, one right after the other, they have this material that's transparent, and then it becomes a mirror for two very brief slices of time. And at the same time, they shine a different laser at the material, so it goes right through when it's transparent and bounces off when it's a mirror. Okay, so instead of there being slits in a card, you have these moments of a material reflecting light. Exactly. And then that reflected light hits a screen, just like in the original double slit experiment, and it creates a different sort of interference pattern. This time, the interference makes the frequency of the light oscillate up and down instead of affecting the brightness which I found very confusing, but the way one of the researchers explained it to me, which was really helpful, which was that in the original experiment, light enters at one angle and comes out at many angles. And in this experiment, the light enters at one frequency and it comes out at many frequencies. So it's a really sort of neat experiment. Uh, Was this result surprising at all? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) It was exactly as expected, which is probably a good thing. Cool. Um, (laughs) The surprising part was actually how fast the material responded to the laser pulses. How fast are we talking? So once the pulse hit, it took a few femtoseconds for the material to turn reflective. What's a femtosecond? It's a millionth of a billionth of a second, and it's way faster than they expected. (laughs) That's amazing. Is there, um, I mean, we always ask this, but is there a, a use for a material that can change that quickly? Yeah, absolutely. It's already in use, this particular material, in a lot of electronics, phone screens, things like that. But this particular property that we didn't know about could be used to make time crystals, which are these absolutely bonkers materials with moving structures that repeat over and over again. Or they could be used in things like telecommunications, where you need to deal with lots of signals very quickly. I do love a good time crystal. (laughs) Doesn't everyone? (laughs) Thank you, Leo. Time for a break and some messages. I've been brushing up on my history with History Hit TV. There's hundreds of hours of documentaries, exclusive films, interviews and ad-free podcasts made for proper history fans. And on this week's patented podcast, our own Matthew Sparks joins Dallas Campbell to talk about the rise of artificial intelligence. Also on that show is Professor Michael Wooldridge from Oxford University, the author of The Road to Conscious Machines, The Story of AI. It's a great show and there's loads more content to get into if you download the app. All the other History Hit podcasts, including Dan Snow's History Hit, and they delve into key events from history with insights from experts, survivors and historians. Go to historyhit.com and enter the code NEWSCIENTIST to get a free month subscription and we'll put a link and that discount code in our show notes. Next up, we have a story about the health of children who've been in immigration detention centres in Australia in the past decade. Penny spoke to our reporter in Australia, Alice Klein. So to begin with, can you give us some background? Why has Australia been keeping child asylum seekers in detention facilities over the past decade? So Australia has a policy of putting all asylum seekers who come here without a valid visa in detention while their claims for protection are being reviewed. In the case of adults, this usually means being housed in these high security immigration detention centres. But for children, Australian law says that they should only be kept in these facilities as a last resort and they should be placed in community housing instead with their families where possible. But then in 2012, we had this really big surge of asylum seekers arriving by boat, um, particularly from Iran. And these included many children who were travelling alone or with their families. So then to try to deter others from coming, the Australian government actually started holding hundreds of these children, peaking at almost 2,000 children in 2013 in high security immigration detention centres as well, and often for many, many years. So what have the conditions been like then for these children? We don't know a huge amount because there has been a lot of secrecy around these detention centres, which are either on the Australian mainland or offshore in places like Nauru and Manus Island. But 
a small number of pediatricians have actually been allowed to visit these centres over the years and they've described really dire conditions. So people living in hot, humid tents surrounded by high wire fences, very little space for children to play or run around in and minimal education or things to do. For example, there was one report by the Australian Human Rights Commission in 2015 of a two-year-old boy who was playing with cockroaches because he didn't have any any toys. Gosh, that's just awful, isn't it? Um, so can you tell me then about this latest study that has looked at the health of these children? So the study was done by the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne, which has a dedicated health service for asylum seekers. And they assessed the physical and mental health of 239 children who visited the service either while they were in detention, which meant that they had to be brought in by guards, or after they were released. And what did they find? So they found that um, 60% of the children had a nutritional deficiency like low iron or vitamin D. None had got any of their routine childhood vaccines while they were in detention, which meant many were behind. And about one-fifth had latent tuberculosis that hadn't been treated. So that was on the physical side. And then on the mental health side, 62% had anxiety, depression or PTSD, plus many also had nightmares and about 10% had self-harmed. And then uh, about three quarters also had um, developmental concerns like autism or learning difficulties. So uh, do we understand why the rates of mental health difficulties are so high amongst these kids? So many of these children had experienced trauma before coming to Australia, but the researchers who did this study believe that holding them in detention made things a lot worse, because, firstly because of those poor living conditions, but also because they just had so much uncertainty about how long they would be in there or, or where they would be taken next. So the average amount of time that the children spent in the Nauru Detention Centre, for example, was four years, which is just such a long time to be enclosed inside a fence. And the paediatricians who visited some of these centres said that there was just this real feeling of hopelessness and despair. And some children had actually tried to kill themselves or were talking about doing it. That's um, really hard to hear, isn't it? So then what happens to these children when they are finally released? So since late 2014, the government has been gradually releasing these children from detention and the last two children were released in 2021, but they were mostly moved into community detention or given temporary protection visas, which, you know, really just continued the uncertainty. But since February this year, the government has finally allowed some to apply for permanent visas. So refugees and asylum seeking has become a hot button topic in in many countries, um, including the UK. And there have been concerns here about the welfare of unaccompanied children housed in hotels, for example. Are there wider lessons here from Australia and, and this study that other countries could be learning? Yeah, I think other countries like the UK really should be looking at Australia as an example of what not to do. Now that we do have this really clear evidence of how severe the impacts of locked detention can be on children's health, especially because, you know, we know from lots of other research that if you experience traumatic events in your developing years, then it can leave scars that can last for a lifetime. Okay, now it's time for life form of the week. And I'm thrilled to say that this is one of my very favourite life forms, the kakapo. Everyone loves the kakapo, surely. How could you not? Yeah, um, it's an incredible word. So uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's the world's largest parrot and it's flightless. And like a lot of birds in New Zealand, it suffered large population loss due to introduced predators, things like cats. And because it's really difficult to breed in captivity, researchers and conservationists have put in this absolutely heroic effort to keep these birds from going extinct. They've sequenced their genomes. They artificially inseminate wild birds with their best genetic matches. They're experimenting with food supplements, just every sort of scientific angle you can think of. And one more fact is that the kakapo is a Maori for night parrot because they're nocturnal as well. Oh, I didn't know that. That's lovely. Yeah. Uh, So currently there are only 250 of them left and they live on a few predator-free islands. So conservationists are trying to establish new populations, but to do that, they need to find, they need to know more about what they could eat if they moved to different places. So what does the latest research say, Sam? 
So uh, Alexander Boast at a New Zealand research institute called Monarchy Wenua and his team looked at preserved scats called coprolites in places like caves where the kakapos roosted in the past, going back to about 400 CE. So and, just to be clear, we're talking fossilised poo here, yeah? yeah well, I'm, I think they're not actually fossilised because they're not that old, but they're preserved. So they haven't mineralised, but they're, um, yeah, they're, they're very old uh, faeces. So. Right. Uh, and they also had some frozen feces, um, some of them going back to 1950s. So uh, they were able to look at those as well. And they looked at the DNA of uh, plant remains and sort of micro fossils in the stool samples. So what did they find? They found dozens of plant families that are not uh, known in the diet of modern kakapos. For example, um, kakapos in some habitats were eating a lot of southern beech, which is a major species in the remaining forests in New Zealand. So that tells us that these forests could be a good habitat for them. They also ate some kinds of mistletoe and wood rose, uh, which are not so abundant now. They're threatened by herbivory and a loss of uh, dispersers and pollinators. But maybe the kakapos were important for dispersing their seeds in the past. So in general, then, the the findings sound like really good news, because if I remember correctly, the, the current populations are really dependent on the fruit of this one tree, the rimu tree. Yeah, the, the rimu is a coniferous tree and they do this um, masting thing like um, like oak trees in the UK. They produce like tons of acorns and they cover the forest floor. The rimu trees drop all their seeds at once and produce loads of food. And this, um, this seems to be a, a trigger for the kakapos to breed. So some scientists think that there are certain foods that stimulate the hormones that um, trigger their breeding behavior. And they think that maybe we can find some new ones. But it might just be that, um, you know, they breed when they find a really abundant food source. So that would be worth knowing about as well. So yeah, the hope is we find other foods that they can thrive on and that might encourage them to breed, but they uh, they still haven't got around to testing that bit yet. Oh well, fingers crossed for good news for the kakapo. And now Claire has another health story for us, and this one I find a bit hard to believe. Um, a study's found that after our brains have a workout, they ramp up their waste disposal system. Is that right? <laughs> yes, it is. It's called the glymphatic system, and it was only discovered about 10 years ago. It's a a kind of very fine network of tubes that drain cerebrospinal fluid out of brain tissue and ultimately away into the blood. So it's it's still rather mysterious as it, it's been discovered so recently. But animal research suggests that it, it helps to take away toxins and compounds made by hardworking brain cells. Surely we've known about cerebrospinal fluid for ages. I, I think I learned about that in school or possibly university. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fair enough. Yes. So we have known that there are cavities within the brain and the spinal cord that contain this fluid that we call cerebrospinal fluid. But we didn't know exactly what it was doing. I mean, there were there was talk that it, it kind of cushions the brain and, and it probably does. But at night when we are sleeping, the fluid is pumped into the brain more and it drains away by this fine network of tubes that I mentioned. And that was what was only discovered in 2012. I love this because it's so exciting that there's this anatomical system that we know yeah. so little about. What's the new finding now then? Uh, Right. So we used to think that this waste disposal system started pumping only when we were asleep. But now a new brain scanning technique has shown some some hints that it can also kick into action when we're awake if we are giving our brains a good workout. So so what constitutes a good workout doing some hard algebra? <laughs> um, that I would find that a hard workout, but what <laughs> they actually tested in this study was they looked asked people to look at a screen with a very intense visual stimulus. It's a kind of spiral black and white checkerboard pattern, and it was flickering as well. So they looked at this for about an hour on and off. It, it gives me a headache just thinking about it. Yeah, I hope the people in the study weren't prone to migraines. Yeah, um, presumably not. Anyway, so they showed people this this flickering pattern intermittently for kind of 16 seconds on and then 16 seconds off. And they could see that when it was on, there was increased blood flow to the visual centres of the brain. They knew that was going to happen this because this pattern is often used in brain scanning studies when they want to study increased blood flow. The surprise was that in the off periods blood flow reduced and there was increased pumping of the fluid into the brain. So did they see then that during this sort of pumping, it was taking away waste products in in the gaps between the stimulation? Well, that that would have been ideal if they had Mm. found that, but I shouldn't overstate uh, the certainty of this finding because they, they couldn't measure 
if any fluid was draining away through the fine tubes of the system because of you know this this brain scanning technique could not see that so that is the next thing that the researchers are going to investigate um but it does seem plausible because we know that that's what cerebrospinal fluid does Oh, yes. And the um, the reason we should care about all this, in, in case you were wondering, is that some previous studies have suggested that um, a poorly functioning waste disposal system could be implicated in some neurological conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And the researchers are even going to start investigating if this, this technique, could be turned into some kind of treatment or prevention method for those um, very you know, devastating conditions. So are you suggesting that people might be able to ward off Alzheimer's by looking at these flickering patterns or, or some other kind of mental workout? I know, I know it does seem bizarre. All I can say is they haven't shown that this works yet. So it would be far, far too soon to start trying this out. But it does seem a really intriguing research avenue to explore. That's all for this week. Thanks to our guests, Leah Crane, Alice Klein and Claire Wilson. Do subscribe to our show and urge everyone you know to listen. Uh, Thanks for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.